Hello, Umakan? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Tapan. Hi, hi. Hi, Sebastian. Hi. hi. So, should we start or we should wait for a couple of minutes? Uh, it's time, so we can start, I think. Four o'clock, right? Okay, okay. As uh, Bahamud was doing it. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Sebastian Wooster, who is the speaker of, of this session. And uh, Professor Wooster is an associate professor at um, ISER Bhopal. So his uh, research mainly focuses on quantum simulations using Rydberg atoms. And he has made many interesting and important contributions um, in the field. And uh, he's also involved in various other research topics related to this, and uh, such as quantum optomechanics, um, analog gravity, and the stochastic quantum field theory. So uh, today he is going to talk about some of his interesting work related to imaging the interface of a qubit and its quantum many-body environment. So Professor Oster, please. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction and also many thanks uh, to the organizers who get this opportunity to talk here. So what I'll be trying to explain to you is that we think that putting a single Rydberg atom into a Bose-Einstein conden condensate would be a very nice platform where one could try to actually see decoherence at work. So essentially we will consider the Rydberg atom as our qubit that can be in two different states. And the Bose-Einstein condensate is the many-body environment that causes decoherence. And unlike most settings, we claim that we can see this uh, environment while it's doing the decoherence. Let me explain that in a bit more detail. Right, so since we heard a lot about quantum computers, uh, I guess you mainly know that decoherence is essentially the arch enemy of quantum computing. Right, because when I have a qubit, I want essentially some very nicely distinguished uh, two different quantum states, zero and one, that can be in a coherent superposition with two complex numbers here, say like a spin down and a spin up state of an isolatedly trapped atom. But of course, in reality, there always is some sort of environment somewhere or the other that we cannot avoid having. And as soon as the qubit interacts with the environment, like shown by these uh, lightnings, whenever that interaction can in any way distinguish between these two qubit states, zero and one, you will invariably be led to this uh, superposition or entangled uh, qubit plus environment state where these psi are some sort of abstract quantum many body state of the environment that tells you environment has interacted with qubit in state zero and here environment has interacted with qubit in state one. Right now, if you want to go back to the description of the qubit alone, we would have to trace over the environment to find the reduced density matrix of the qubit. And uh, as long as this psi one and psi zero, uh, zero have remained effectively constant or they are the same state, so the environment has not interacted with the qubit, then you have a coherence matrix element in the density matrix here, proportional to the C zero times C one coefficients, right? But as soon as these many body states are orthogonal, the coherence has vanished and we can no longer observe all the core features of our qubit, right? So essentially then it has become totally useless for quantum computing, right? And of course, as Psi zero and Psi one are microscopic many body states, they tend to become orthogonal rather quickly once anything happens to the environment. And so this essentially is the root cause of decoherence. It means our qubit has entangled with the environment in such a way that these attached states here, Psi zero and Psi one have become orthogonal. Right, so we want to now apply this to a Rydberg atom in a BEC. Let me first put that also in a slightly different context of just the quantum impurity. So it means we have a sort of fairly regular and well understood microscopic system, such like this crystal lattice here, and we put something there that doesn't belong, yeah, some sort of impurity species or uh, defect in the crystal. And then lots of qualitatively new features arrive also in condensed metaphysics. And for that reason, it's actually in a relatively active research field to put these impurities into, a, say, Bose-Einstein condensate or ultra-cold gas, where we have lots of choices. We can put a molecule, some atom of a different species, or some ions. Right? In all these cases, then you can do interesting ion atom uh, scattering physics. You can look at the formation of these polarons when the impurity affects the environment, or look at the angular momentum dynamics if you take something as complex as a molecule. And in this talk, I focus on one specific 
impurity here, namely a single rootback atom and one specific environment or bulk system that's the Bose-Einstein condensate. Right? And then you'd expect schematically the same thing to happen what I've shown you on slide one. The rootback impurity, say, can be in these two qubit states, some very high principal quantum number, no angular momentum, and some very high principal quantum number, one unit of angular momentum, sketching the orbits here. And if that has interacted with my Bose-Einstein condensate, after a little while, there'll be that sort of entangled state happening again. And now what I'll try to convince you of in the rest of the talk is like, unlike your typical many body environment, here there might be a chance to actually see this environmental aspect of that entangled state and not just its effect on the decoherence of the qubit. Uh, let me, despite that probably being unnecessary in this audience, let me run you through the standard introduction of what the Rudbeck atom is and why it's cool. Right, so if I look at my usual hydrogen type of state, the three, three quantum numbers, the principal quantum number n and l and m for the angular momentum, then as long as we're sitting deeply here in the ground state of the Coulomb well, that's a really tiny electron wave function that extends by about one Bohr radius. Now, as we are exciting this atom to higher and higher electronic states, the orbital radius of the electron scales like principal quantum number squared. So these Rydberg atoms become huge really quickly. Oh, the atom becomes huge really quickly. And once it's significantly huge, we call it a Rydberg atom. So for example, at the principal quantum number of 20, that'd be larger than your average biomolecule or this carbon nanotube. And the principal quantum number of 100, the size of the electron orbit, if I define that to be the size of my atom, is half a micron. So that's the size of an optical wavelength and larger than most, most viruses. Now we are looking ahead that I want to put that Rydberg atom as an impurity into a bulk system. It should be clear that if the electron is uh, venturing up to a half a micrometer out from the iron core, this is also the range, relatively large range over which the Rydberg atom can be expected to affect the environment. And that is the reason why the things that I'll tell you about later will be possible. As I said, the plan is to chuck the Rydberg atom into a Bose-Einstein condensate. So you've all probably seen this cartoon that as we have your classical gas of atom at fixed position and the spacing D as we're cooling that down further and further, the momentum decreases and therefore the thermal de Broglie wavelength increases until the point that these wavelengths reach the interparticle spacing. So they begin to overlap and ultimately they form this Bose-Einstein condensed phase where all the atoms occupy that one single particle state in the absolute ground state. From a mathematical point of view, that's nice because I no longer have to handle a nasty many body wave function that has three n dimensions for n particles, but I essentially can just write that as the product of the same single particle wave function, uh, namely this one here, occupied by all n atoms. Right? And as a consequence, if I want to do quantum many body physics starting with the field operator, I just replace that field operator with my mean field wave function. And in that way, I can derive something called the gross pitevsky equation that describes the dynamics and the ground state of this one single wave function occupied by all the atoms. And this looks suspiciously like just the Schrodinger equation with the one important difference, right? So there's the kinetic energy and the potential, that's the same. The difference is that nonlinear term here that now depends on the wave function modulo squared that is effectively the density of atoms. So the number density of atoms. And that term arises because we are including elastic S-wave scattering. So two atoms can kick each other and then come out again. And because of the ultra cold temperatures, S-wave scattering is sufficient to look at these microscopic dynamics. And so the key point here is that we've boiled down our nasty three n dimensional quantum many body problem down to three dimensions. And another point that will be important later is that this mean field wave function is just a complex uh, quantum mechanical wave function that carries phase information. And so now we can combine the two things uh, because that is something that is actually happening in experiments, right? So most Rydberg atoms are typically excited in an ultra cold uh, atomic setting. So then just going from an ultra cold gas of micro Kelvin to a Bose-Einstein condensate of nano Kelvin is a relatively straightforward uh, idea. And then we really have some very extreme atoms with that large size that are talked about in an extreme environment of these nano Kelvin temperature and um, fully quantum coherent. And so this picture is taken from the paper by the Stuttgart group where they've excited a single Rydberg atom at the center of this DEC of 100,000 atoms. 
in very high principal quantum number states where say n equal 100 is the blue ball in the center and n equal 200, the Rüttberg electron orbit is almost as wide as the entire BC or is as wide. Right? And I'm flashing a couple of other groups that I'm aware of that are actually exciting Rüttberg states within the BEC down there. Yeah, from our theory point of view, I just advertise this as a fairly nice prototypical open quantum system. We know that most Rydberg physics typically we can get away with if we do it correctly, with just a few quantum states that really are relevant. Yeah, let's say already thinking ahead of what I want to show you, we superimpose an angular momentum S or P state. The Bose-Einstein condensate is a very nice environment in that it's well controlled. It's mainly the mean field. But then I also know what the excitations are, namely sound waves in this case, or quantized phonons. And we also relatively well think that we understand the interactions between the Rydberg atom and the BEC that I'll tell you about in the next few slides in more detail. This is just the advertisement of one of our earlier papers where we show that one can even tune those interactions, but I'll not mention that later. Okay, so the talk will be essentially three pieces. I just run you through the primary effect of that happens with the BEC once I throw the Rydberg atom inside. That will be called phase imprinting. The main part will be to discuss the decoherence of one of these Rydberg superpositions that I try to push into a S plus P superposition. What happens to it if it's in the BEC? And then finally, I'll show you some, say, idea stage uh, discussion on how to use this for quantum simulations of decoherence in energy transport. So as I already said, it's an experimental, essentially uh, the done thing to excite a very high Rydberg state within a Bose-Einstein condensate. And as you already also see from that figure up here, this reaches a very uh, crazy scenario where the Rydberg electron, say uh, that's the blue shade, is actually going out so far that there can be hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands of ground state atoms in the orbital volume. Right? And I guess everyone's intuition would cry out that this should destroy the Rydberg atom immediately. And the reason that does not happen is that, well, BEC is very cold, right? So the ground state atoms in the BEC all have not a lot of energy available. And turns out at these nano Kelvin temperatures that energy isn't even enough typically to cause the Rydberg state transition to any adjacent Rydberg state let alone destroy the Rydbeckett. So consequently, what the experiments actually do find is that a Rydberg atom in the Bose-Einstein condensate behaves mostly like you'd expect from an isolated Rydberg atom with a somewhat reduced lifetime, right? So it's not like nothing happens. Lifetime reduces by factors of a half or one tenth, so significant, but not catastrophic. Are there any questions up to here? I forgot to say, please do interrupt me at any moment with questions. Uh, I'd rather answer them on the fly than later. But later is also fine. So what now happens if this ground set atom shown in green is moving inside of the Rydberg electron orbital volume. So here the sketch, the blue ball is the ion of the Rydberg atom. The blue line is the electron probability density on a cut through this uh, orbital volume. And as my ground set atom is moving inside the orbital volume, essentially it can scatter off the electron or the electron scatters of the ground state atom, right? This is described by electron atom S-wave scattering with that scattering length AE here. And as in typical S-wave scattering between two atoms, I can just describe that with the delta function potential. So the potential is assumed to be so short range that only if the electron wax straight onto the atom does it feel anything. And the strength of that potential is governed by that scattering length. And that scattering length is negative. So now when I want to move from the ground state atom electron interaction to ground state atom Rydberg atom interaction, I essentially have to weigh this potential with the probability to actually find the electron in a certain place. Yeah, so this psi E here, sorry for using the symbol that I had earlier for the field operator. So frequently on the next slide, typically psi of that kind would be the Rydberg electron wave function. Right, so this is Rydberg electron wave function mod squared times a negative P factor. So the potential actually has this form. Right? And as potentials go, this is a rather crazy one. Right? So it really has all these uh, fast or short wavelength oscillations. And it, as you can see, it is sort of mostly attractive. So it would try to pull that ground state atom somewhere towards the ion. 
right? Also, you can see there's lots of potential minima. So as one would expect, it is possible for that ground state atom to form a bound state, for example, here in this outer well. And that's, that gives rise to these uh, famous ultra long range Schrodberg molecules, for example, one of the first ones seen in that paper there, or the first one. And so we essentially in the rest of our project for the theory, we assume this doesn't happen and one can avoid it. Right, so we want to essentially talk about uh, non-bound ground atoms. As long as I have just a single Rudbeck atom sitting there in the BEC, right, so that means all the ground set atoms also feel this interaction potential once they're nearby the ion. So essentially, I just insert that here in the same manner like I would insert, insert an external potential into the Rospedevsky equation. Yeah, so now my claim is that the Bose-Einstein condensate wave function evolves in time according to this typical kinetic energy plus nonlinear part due to atomic collisions, plus this potential due to the red bracket. This is very large. If you look at the energy scales, that stuff typically exceeds by many orders of magnitude your typical BEC energy scales. That means in the very first instance for short times, I just neglect these two pieces. That makes the gross pedevsky equation essentially a piece of cake to solve. And what you find is that the complex wave function for the condensate just gets this exponential phase factor that essentially has the same profile in space as that crazily oscillating Rudbeck electron probability density. Right? And that means uh, two things, right? So the phase pattern, if I'm plotting the complex phase of the wave function after some short time, right? so first of all, it looks very oscillatory because of all these wiggles in the wave function. And it depends on the quantum state. Right here, this psi again was the Rudbeck electron wave function that differs if I have an angular momentum S state or a P state. Right, so the imprinted phase pattern onto the condensate depends on the state. Now, after some, if you wait a little longer, this is a bit of a tangent to the main part of the talk. the atoms to move under the inertia from that momentum kick. And what we then therefore see is that after some time, for example, when a Rudbeck atom have moved through here, it leaves these sort of density tracks in the BEC. Right? In the other work, we have explored what happens if I'm now shooting many, many Rudbeck atoms at roughly the same place in a short moment of time, essentially with the objective to increase a correspondingly larger perturbation of the density. However, now for the remainder of the project, we want to focus, uh, sorry, of the talk, what we want to focus on is a single Rudbeck atom that is not moving and that is just affecting the condensate mainly via that phase imprint. Um, but in contrast to all the earlier works, we now allow two internal states right, so that we can have a qubit. Are there any questions up to here? My computer just told me my internet connection was unstable. Did you? Yes. Yeah, so there is one question. In the chat box. Uh, I, I don't think I can multitask that. Can you just read that for me? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So the question is, in case of a pure BC, the scattering length is tuned by flashback resonance. Here, how do you tune this? We are not tuning anything. So there's two scattering lengths hidden in this, in this equation. Um, here, this parameter that uh, determines the strength of the Rydberg atom ground set atom interaction. That is the electron atom S wave scattering length. So we just take the normal basic value. And then in here, there is also an atom atom scattering length. I think that is relatively unimportant for everything that I'll talk about later. And also there, we take whatever is the basic value. Uh, there is currently no tuning here in this talk. Uh, you're right that this one could be controlled by a Feshbach resonance. I'm not aware of any control over the electron atom one, but should be possible by similar tricks? No, no, I guess not actually. Right, so uh, simply what I'll talk about will require no tuning. You can probably tune it if you have to. Let me know if that did not answer the question. All right, let's go on to the decoherence of the Rydberg qubit. Right, so I'm switching notation halfway through the talk. Uh, I must admit I was too lazy to redesign all the 
all the slides, right? So now earlier, what I called for the for the qubit state zero and one is going to be called spin down and spin up now, right? So we take our qubit as an effective spin a half system. And whenever I draw the spin down, this means root back S state and spin up means root back P state. Right? So please keep that in mind. As I said earlier, if you chuck those into a root back, uh, into a BEC by themselves, they imprint a different phase pattern onto the mean field. Uh, but now what if I'm actually starting in a quantum superposition for my rootback atom of S plus P, right? So imagine I excite first a rootback S state in the BEC, and then I make a very fast and short microwave pulse to bring it in a superposition S plus P. I have only one mean field available, so now we get into trouble, right? So it relatively strongly suggests we should go beyond mean field field. Uh, so we have done that. We started more or less from scratch, right? So if you allow atoms in three different quantum states, in the ground state, uh, that's mainly meant for the BC here in the background, and in S and P rootback states for my qubit, then I start from a quantum many body Hamiltonian that has field operators with three indices, GSP, and interactions between all these possible states. Right? This is way too messy for us. So essentially we put in lots of simplifications. The most important one being that we say, okay, our ground state atoms are Bose-Einstein condensed. So we replace that field operator by the mean field wave function and this typical sum over Bogilubov excitations, right? So these operators BB dagger essentially create and destroy sound waves here shown as wiggly orange line in the Bose-Einstein condensate. And otherwise they just work like harmonic oscillator creation and destruction operators. And the other simplification is there's just one rootback atom. It can be an S or P and sits there in the center and doesn't move anywhere. Right. And then according to what I've shown you on the earlier slides, the interaction between the ground state atom and the Rydberg atom has the shape here of the Rydberg electron wave function, these two, and depends on whether it's an S or P. Right. Depending on that, I have a different shape of my interaction. And these two interactions are plugged into that part. Then we do a relatively lengthy calculation to boil this down to something useful and we arrive of what is known as the spin boson Hamiltonian. Right, so essentially, since we are since we're describing the Rydberg qubit as a pseudo spin, there's a spin up and spin down. This is described down here by these Pauli operators. Yeah, for example, sigma z is just the difference between the p and the s population. And the only thing that's left over from the BEC essentially are these Bogilobov phonon creation and destruction operators. The key bit here of this Hamiltonian is that interaction part, right? So this now essentially says, if the rootback atom is changing the state, this will cause the creation of perturbations in my Bose-Einstein condensed background, right? And the key outcome of our calculation was the calculation of these coupling constants. And there are a couple of extra terms that I've kept under the rack here, and they won't be important for anything I say later. More or less the same idea for ground state impurities. So just uh, another species of atom within the same BEC has been followed through by groups of Yaksch and Levenstein and maybe others I'm not aware of. In some of what follows, I will also want to add a microwave drive between the Rydberg S and the P state. So uh, here I added a sigma X term to, the, to describe the Rydberg pseudospin. If you want to look at uh, decoherence, typically what we want to resort to are open quantum system techniques. That means we first have to de define what is actually our system and what is the environment. Right? And the system is going to be here, the Rydberg atom that can be in either S or P, and that has these S parts of the Hamiltonian. And the environment is the Bose-Einstein condensate, which in our approximation, there'll be nothing dynamic about it, except these Bogolobov uh, phonon operators. And they have a certain energy and they can be created by the Rydberg atom through the interaction term. So this interaction term essentially measures, I told you earlier, the coherence needs that the environment can tell the difference between the two qubit states, zero and one. Right? So here it has to be able to tell the difference between the Rydberg S and the P state. And consequently, we are not surprised to see that these uh, system environment coupling coefficients here, dependent on the phonon wave number Q, are essentially something like the Fourier transform of the difference of the Rydberg 
electron density in the B state and in the S state. Right, so since these are sort of three-dimensional hydrogen wave functions, some of which depend on, on the polar angle theta, and so this integration is actually relatively nasty, right? but so ultimately I will not torture you with that, I'll just show you the results. Right? Anyone uh, knowledgeable in open quantum systems knows that more or less the only thing we need to know about the environment are the autocorrelation functions about this environmental part of the system environment coupling operator. Right, so essentially this measures something like if I'm perturbing my Bose-Einstein condensate at time zero and I'm pushing some phonons in there, how will that correlate sometime t, uh, some delay time to or later, how will it act back on the system? And so we can calculate these ones, we know these coupling constants and I'm showing you here some representative uh, Bose-Einstein condensate autocorrelation function for the insertion of a Rydberg state in principal quantum number 40. When you see that after 40 microseconds, the correlation function drops to zero, that means the, the BEC has forgotten that we put the Rydberg atom in before. Right? But these 40 microseconds are really long, right? So it doesn't forget very easily. And I'll show you later that this actually then means that most Rydberg dynamics will be non Markovian. The second output we can take from these plots already is the correlation function at time zero that will be inversely proportional in some way to the decoherence time in the system. And I'll show you that later again, but for now only the probably not unexpected result that if I'm plotting these um, autocorrelations at time zero of my environment operator over as a function of principal quantum number, it varies over orders of magnitude. And therefore these decoherence times range from something like 20 nanoseconds at relatively low principal quantum numbers to microseconds at the larger ones. And these uh, orders of magnitude scaling of physics as a function of principal quantum number is of course something we know, love and expect whenever we are handling the packets. Well, and with that, I hope that it's relatively likely that whatever I'll tell you about later will be experimentally observable in one corner or the other, depending on which times one wants here. Are there any questions up to now? Okay. Uh, no, no, not nothing in the chat box. Please go ahead. Okay. So uh, you are not audible, you are muted. So I don't know how I did that. Okay, so the calculations I've shown you earlier uh, are the challenging calculations, so we needed a self-check. And in finding a self-check, we also found what we think is a relatively nice orthogonal method to calculate the decoherence properties or dynamics of quantum impurities in a Bose-Einstein condensate. Right, so essentially, we realized that as long as I'm not putting any microwave drive between the spin up and the spin down state or the P and the S state. Right, so this Hamiltonian that we found contains absolutely no coupling between the P and the S state. Right, so in terms of spins, that means my quantum many body Hamiltonian, whatever it is, decomposes into two huge blocks, one block for spin up and one block for spin down. And that means that whenever I have any sort of wave function that says I'm in a superposition of up and my Bose-Einstein condensate is doing something, plus I'm in state down and my Bose-Einstein condensate is doing something, these doing something will just be evolving according to their respective block in the Hamiltonian. Now, when I want to look at the coherence between the Rydberg S and P state. So I've shown you in the introduction that what that amounts to in the, whenever the system environment state has this bipartite form is that the coherence matrix elements just gets the overlap of these two quantum many body states associated with the two states of my qubit. And now I have two methods available at least to calculate that. One of them is I take that spin boson Hamiltonian, I put in all the experimental parameters and use it to calculate the time evolution of these Bogolubov operators, right? And then I can, with that, calculate this expectation value. However, what I can also do is say, if I'm within one of these blocks of my many body Hamiltonian, there is only one Rydberg atom. And earlier work has shown us that we expect one Rydberg atom in a BSC, I mean, in one, one Rydberg state, sorry, there's only one, one electronic state. Right, so that other work has shown that a single electronic state in the BEC for Rydberg impurity should be mostly described by mean field theory. 
gross pedevsky equation. Right? So now essentially what we're proposing is just calculate the, what the BEC is doing if you're putting a S root back atom inside. And we also calculate what happens if you put a B root back atom inside. And this were these two pictures I'd shown you earlier. Now I, in my head, calculate a sort of fake many body wave function from my gross pedevsky orbital. Right, so I have one mean field wave function from the GPE that is three dimensional here. I rescale that such that it's a single particle wave function. And I take the n fold tensor product. And then I plug that into this many body overlap. Right, so essentially we're saying, let's calculate this guy here. That is a nasty many body wave function um, scalar product simply as the overlap between my, my two different solutions of the Gospodevsky equation, where I'm embedding an S root back atom or a P root back atom and exponentiate to the power n, right? And I, of course, wouldn't be spending all that time telling you if it wasn't very nicely working, right? So we have here in three different lines, the magnitude of the coherence factor between the Rudbeck S and the P state. So one means a fully coherent quantum superposition. Initially, that's what we have. And then on that expected time scale of sub one microsecond, with all these methods at our disposal, we see that uh, quickly decoheres. Right, so now if I do some sort of microwave Ramsey measurement on my Rudbeck impurity, we believe that it should be more or less straightforward to read out exactly this curve. Are there any questions up to here? Yeah, yeah, one of, yes? There are two questions, uh, one by uh, Saika. Uh, so, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Or? One second, let me. Oh, I, I, actually, I, I managed to figure out how to see it. It's not that hard. Do we see any yes. revivals? So, in, in this uh, calculation so far, we don't. We are also assuming there is an infinitely extended homogeneous BC in the background. So, I wouldn't really have any expectation that there could be a revival. We are more or less uh, planning in the future to extend those calculations to smaller finite size condensate. And then, for example, I would guess maybe some revival could be there. So by revival, I assume that you meant sort of revival of the coherence here. So why is the BC considered as the environment? Is BC an ideal environment? Is it not possible to create a close to ideal isolated atom to eliminate the coherence? Um, yeah, so of course, I mean, if you say you want to build a quantum computer, then you obviously don't put a Rudbeck atom into a BEC. Yeah? So you can, of course, as we had seen in very nice talks earlier in this workshop, by now very nicely actually just suppress the fact that the environment messes everything up. Right? So the idea here is that we are purposefully putting an environment in order to study it. Right? We want to see decoherence at work to understand it better. For example, to understand the quantum classical transition. Let me know if that answered or didn't answer the questions. Okay, so for now, I, I, I have shown you these um, two methods to see the decoherence of the quantum impurity in the VEC. One of them is very easy, actually, and uh, therefore I just sort of advocated a bit. The, the selling point of, of measuring a graph like this would be that, as you kind of suggested, I can maybe probe some properties of the VEC. But now I want to get to the main point. That is, can we somehow see this, in fact, many body entangled state, right? So here, one part of this quantum superposition is that my 100,000 BEC atoms are in a quantum superposition of that state or that, that state, right? Can one see something like that? And the proposal here would be, let's first map the entanglement from sort of involving in an essential way, both pieces, the qubit and the environment, into one that involves only the environment. Right? For that, we drive a very fast, strong pi half microwave pulse that sends each of these spin states into a superposition themselves again. And if you rewrite that a bit, you're getting the state shown down here. And now we measure the Rydberg state, say, by selective field ionization, which is the standard technique, and say we find up. Right? And then we know the quantum anybody state of the BEC by itself is itself a quantum superposition of these two pieces, if you so want a quantum superposition of these two phase imprinted patterns. Right? If I'd measured the other one, no problem, I also get the superposition just with a different phase. Right? And now the, to get back to the question from the beginning, is it possible in this very coherent scenario to actually image the fact that we have here a quantum superposition of a BC that has interacted with these two different impurity states? 
right? And we believe the answer is yes. So what is shown here is what the experimental signature might be. Right? This is the column density, right? So column density means like in this cartoon, right? So you have a three-dimensional Bose-Einstein condensate cloud, you shine your laser sideways and you get the net absorption signal across the Z direction, which is proportional to the single atom density along the Z direction. And what we are showing is the difference of what one would expect in a quantum superposition state of the kind advertised or if instead, I, right, so here, let's assume they are 50-50 weightage, the spin up imprint and the spin down imprint. Right, so we are subtracting what you would get in a boring classical 50-50 mixture of up and down. Right, so this subtracted signal is just the 50-50 average of my imprint shape if a Rudbeck S state is in the BUC or a Rudbeck P state. Right, and the, the shape of the signal is always here. You see it's some sort of mixture of the S and P orbital, right? So the quantization axis is along this direction. When the size of that signal is a little interesting, right? It goes from initially zero to a maximum and then down to zero again, right? And that is also understandable because at the beginning, psi up and psi down are the same, right? So the whole assumption is I have this sort of state of qubit and environment before any interaction takes place, the environment is just in whatever initial state it is, right? So here, psi up and psi down are the same initially. Uh, mind you, they don't have to be orthogonal in anything I'm doing here. Right, so initially, these two are the same, and then obviously these two densities are the same. In the final state, it also has to be zero because the state we are claiming to have is essentially some superposition where all 100,000 atoms are, have somehow responded to the S impurity or to the P impurity. And in this by itself also massively entangled state, if I'm taking a single atom density and S and phi S and phi P are orthogonal, then I've lost my signal, right? So essentially after decoherence is complete, we know again, the, the signature has to be the one from the classical mixture. So the signal is sort of a transient glimpse of this decoherence at work. Like in the moment that it happens, we can in fact, see that mesoscopically entangled state of the environment that messes up the coherence of the qubit. Right, so I think this is sort of fundamentally interesting, but it might actually also be practically useful to understand the coherence a bit better and maybe find some sort of tricks to combat it, like uh, coherence protection. Okay, are there any uh, questions at this point? Right, so this is, I'd say, the, at least for my advertisement side, the main result of the talk. Yeah, there is, there is one question. Um, by C. Sidanpati Rago. So, do the solitons in BC act as a potential to the added rebel atoms? And uh, there are no solid. I, I don't know where solitons come from now. I'm not talking about solitons. The second part of the question is can you shed some light on the rebel atom soliton interaction? So, no solitons. No solitons, okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, so essentially the take home message of this is we do believe like that question that I asked at the beginning, this is a relatively unique or to my knowledge, unique platform where one can see the fact that the environment of an open quantum system also goes into an entangled state in the moment that decoherence happens. And then to push this a little further in the final part of our uh, project, Let's add this continuous microwave drive between the Rudbeck S and the P state. So I'm essentially adding this term to the Hamiltonian where my Rudbeck atom now can make transitions from S to P because of the external microwave. In that moment, all this discussion that I had on the last few slides goes down the drain. And the reason is that you're losing that block structure in the Hamiltonian, right? So now we have pieces in the Hamiltonian that couple the spin up and the spin down block. And I no longer can use the Gospidevsky equation. I no longer can easily analytically calculate what happens. And therefore I have to resort to these uh, open quantum system techniques. And like I said, open quantum system techniques essentially just re require us to know these correlation functions. We know these correlation functions. And without going in the details, then I'd ask you to believe that uh, there exists a method for which we effect that's discussed here for which we essentially can find all the four matrix elements of the reduced density matrix for this Rudbeck qubit, right? So whether it's a population in P or in S and whether there's some coherence. 
Uh, this is done through some stochastic techniques. And with that, now if we look here in this diagram on the coherence between the S and the P state, see that for, for a very weak microwave that sort of quickly decoheres, that would be on par with the timescales I'd shown you before. And as we're increasing the amplitude of the microwave uh, coupling, decoherence becomes slower and slower. Right? So there's one take home message that this coupling in the qubit combats decoherence. This is sort of known, but very nicely visible here. And another feature are these oscillations of the coherence. That means the system decoheres, then it recoheres a bit, and then it decoheres more. And that is typically a signature of non Markovian dynamics. Yeah, non Markovian dynamics means I cannot predict what happens to my density matrix in the future by just knowing the present. I also have to know the past of the density matrix, like what happened before. Yeah, and that uh, non Markovianity can be quantified using a measure invented by Breuer in this article. So this is just, I don't want to go into the details there either. They're essentially scanning the microwave frequency and find that that decides if the system is very non-Markovian or less non-Markovian, right? But we can also pinpoint that it is definitely non-Markovian. That means that Rydberg atom is pushed in, it sort of affects the environment. And at a later time, that affected environment talks back to that Rydberg qubit. All right, so that concludes that uh, middle and main part on the decoherence of a single Rydberg qubit. In the remaining, what, some too many minutes actually for what I plan to tell you, uh, let me move this towards quantum simulations of energy transport. All right, so this is one of our main interests, essentially quantum simulations of decoherence or of like bringing decoherence under control in some experiments. What we frequently refer to is energy transport in photosynthetic light harvesting. So a sort of simplistic cartoon of how that works is here is a light harvesting protein that some organisms, in this case, a bacteria, use to convert energy from sunlight into chemically useful energy. And the way that works is that this protein complex contains a bunch of these large biomolecules called, called chlorophyll. They are arranged in a more or less regular structure in this case in a ring. And as your photon from sunlight comes in, it can excite one of these ground state molecules to a excited electronic state. This excitation energy can then jump to the neighboring molecule through resonant dipole-dipole interactions. And it can keep doing that until it reaches another bioprotein complex that's called the reaction center, where that excitation energy is essentially used to pump a proton from one side of a membrane to the other side and that essentially converts that uh, finicky electronic excitation energy into stable electrostatic energy that the organism can more or less use whenever it wants later. Yeah, our basic starting point for a Rydberg atom quantum simulator of this process is what we call a Rydberg aggregate or we'd call a Rydberg chain that are just a bunch of isolatedly trapped single atoms in Rydberg states. So all of these atoms are in a Rydberg state most of them in this angular momentum S state and one of them in the angular momentum P state that has slightly higher energy. And now through the same resonant dipole-dipole interactions as in the molecules, this excitation energy can transfer from one atom to the neighboring atom over distances up to 10 to 20 micrometers, right? And then migrate on this chain just that it did in the molecule, right? So now we want to explore how far can we push this analogy to sort of maybe make some interesting proposals for quantum simulation platforms of this energy transport. But the, the selling point here would be that this happens on much larger distances and slower timescales. So it is more easily interrogated. And also the Rydberg system pristinely is fully quantum coherent, right? So there's been essentially very nice experiments, for example, in the group of Antoine Bové, where they've seen this quantum transport as per Schrodinger's equation. Right, because the atom is nice and clean. In contrast, the molecule is a very complex, messy object that has many, many internal degrees of freedom and hence vibrates crazily like this. Right? And at the same time, that bioprotein sits in a room temperature water bath. Right? So the actual light harvesting trans energy transport and photosynthesis is very strongly subject to decoherence and to disorder. Right? So the energy of maybe adjacent molecules isn't exactly the same as shown here. Right, so all of this would have to be implemented in a useful quantum simulator. Now, let me briefly 
advertise on a tangent some earlier work where we've partially succeeded to propose something that does that. And for that to make, make the system incoherent, essentially we said, let's put all these rootback atoms into a background called ground state atom thermal gas. And on, on that gas, we are running EIT. EIT involves somehow also rootback states and through details that are too complicated to explain now, one can show that one can push the system from a quantum coherent energy transport where you see lots of interference, maxima and minima here. This is the probability to have that single P excitation in the system on any side of my, my rootback chain. And we can make that classical looking like a diffusion process or we can build in disorder. And all of that can be controlled through the parameters of these lasers here running the EIT electromagnetically induced transparency on my, on my background atoms. Uh, but the drawback from the point of view of simulating photosynthetic light harvesting is this is all Markovian and this is all dephasing. So in fact, it will have slightly different environmental properties than one would expect from these vibrations of the molecules that are known to be the main thing here in photosynthetic light harvesting. So the final phase of the project that I've shown you the single atom results of is going to be to generalize rootback atoms in a BEC to many rootback atoms in a BEC arranged in this chain type of structure. Again, they can be in an orange P state or blue S state. If I use a basis where pi n means the nth atom is in the P state, then we know that you will find the Hamiltonian as such, where this first term is a resonant dipole-dipole term where the P excitation gets jumped from site n to site m. And then we again coupling to these phonons in the BEC in a manner shown here. So essentially it says, if site n is excited, then phonons will come. Right? And it so happens that this Hamiltonian takes the same form like the Holstein model, which is what one uses to describe the, in the simplest way, the effect of molecular vibrations on that energy transport in molecular systems, right? And so there are these high states would just be ground state, ground state, ground state, excited state for the molecules. And these betas, instead of global phonons, they are vibrations, internal vibrations of the molecule. Right? so we have already the right Hamiltonian. We still need to figure out if we can also get the right parameters. The right parameters means all of these three energy scales must be the same. And that is how the situation is in, in a photosynthetic light harvesting complex. And that is part of the reason why properly including or understanding these molecular vibrations is somewhat more challenging. Right? So you can't do any interesting uh, simplifying scale separation. Okay, so I hope to be able to give you the final results in this direction in a matter of months, perhaps. I'd like to thank all the guys that did the hard work on this, most notably the ones in the box for which it's part of their PhD project. I'd like to acknowledge funding by the Max Planck Society for India Max Planck Partner Group and by SERP and DST on these uh, signs of rootback impurities in the BEC. I'd like to thank the rest of the group for their enthusiasm and general presence. And then I'd like to thank you for your attention and just leave this summary here for reading. I'm happy to answer more questions if there are. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for, for the very nice talk. So uh, we have time for questions. Yeah, Sarkat, you can unmute yourself and ask the question, Sarkat goes. Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, really nice talk. Uh, so I had a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, this is kind of just speculating. Uh, the first of where you talked about the phase imaging and you showed some images of the uh, Reaper atom actually leaving tracks on the BC. Yep. So those are in some ways uh, very reminiscent of the second half of your talk where you talk about open quantum systems. And, you know, like this is kind of these tracks um, are... Uh, you know, if one zooms in, whether there are like, like the, one can actually study friction from there and whether there is a correlation between this kind of uh, tracks and whether you can relate, relate that to the time scales you find in open quantum system studies. Yeah, so in, 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 this, in this part, say uh, we haven't been concerned with decoherence because there was only one electronic state. Now, of course, one could look at decoherence between different spatial locations and all that. But so in pieces of this talk that I cut out, but maybe now I have an excuse to show you. Right, so essentially we think that these tracks, I mean, firstly, they remind us a lot of uh, 
like a bubble chamber in particle physics, right? So yeah. that mm -hmm. high energy particle goes through the medium and leaves the track. And we, we mm -hmm. think this could be actually used to say, uh, look at cold, uh, cold collision. Oh, I can't show that. But you almost also have like jagged edges of the tracks, like which are kind of like, um, if one zooms in. Probably. Yeah, so this is uh, probably relatively complicated dynamics. So we try to imprint a pie face. So there's been some mm -hmm. speculations that maybe this uh, sort of outer fringe here is a, is a dark soliton. So I think we figured out later it's not, right? But certainly this, mm -hmm. um, I mean, after the initial phase imprint, it just sort of creates a pie face on the track. Then mm -hmm. we take the root back atom out and wait a lot longer, and then it makes these shock waves. Right, so there is a lot of stuff happening here that we haven't looked in full detail at. Right, so our idea was maybe we can use these tracks to figure out if uh, two rootback atoms attract or repel, or if they change electronic state along the line. Right, so really use it like in yeah. particle physics, where they use these bubble chambers to understand high energy particles. Here you use this uh, rootback BEC, uh, BEC to understand rootback dynamics. Yeah, there was I think some experiments uh, early on uh, from Ketterle's group where they trapped these BECs on a chip. And they basically saw this uh, tracks of the currents, the jagged edges of the currents imp getting imprinted on the BC. So they saw kind of jagged edges on the BC very close to the current wires trapping. So this was reminding of that almost here. Yeah, yeah, maybe. And the, a second question I had was regarding your non Markovian dynamics. So corresponding to those reservoir memory scale uh, times, like decorance time scales, if you're shorter than that. So can you actually also reverse back the dynamics and get the excitation? This is not really a, like, a kind of echo-like things. Like that is, again, getting... sounds like the earlier question, whether there is a revival. Revival, so, but this is not like finite side re revival. This is just like whether you can forcefully re reverse the dynamics. with the echo -like uh, So to some extent you see here, right? So it, it sort of decoheres and comes back up. We haven't really played with under which conditions can we get that come up fully the full way. I would expect intuitively that in this simple homogeneous background that we have right, that is infinitely extended it's like you're creating sound waves and they go out and they don't come back or they shouldn't come back so i, I wouldn't expect there to be a lot of uh, tunability regarding these revivals so in in one of the next steps what we want to look at what if i put that root back atom into a finite size trap bc and then i can play with the trapping potential to maybe get these sound waves go out and come back Right, so in fact, there is one work by the group of Walter Strunz in Dresden where they've looked at that somewhat. Right, so that the phonons excited in the BEC in a trap, they actually sort of go out, they reflect off the surface and they come back. And then of course, they will again affect the impurity. So we want to look at that later, right? So right now we haven't really tried to say, make the coherence come back all the way, but be certainly interesting. Okay, thank you. So any other questions from the audience? Um, I don't see anything in the chat box. So yeah, if not, can I ask one more question? Yeah, please. please yeah, so ahead. when you have this coupled uh, very many red bug atoms, or even like some, like this uh, transport, the last part you were talking about. Yep, yep. So even like many um, is harder. Like if I just take two, uh, for example, in that case, do you expect that uh, there might be this coupled modes of the Rydberg atoms which might get decoupled from the BEC, like dark modes kind of, and which might be like in a decoherence free subspace? I would expect that not because, uh, so I don't know exactly which, which modes or states you're talking about, but as long as it involves any sort of superpositions of different states for these two atoms, I would expect my environment through these imprint patterns, right, and can tell whether it's the left atom or the right atom. Right? But looking at decoherence-free subspaces was one of the things we had we thought might be interesting here. For that, I would rather than go to, right? So, so far, we have totally ignored the fact that the Rydberg P state, of course, has three azimuthal sublevels, right? M1, 0, and minus 1. And the 1 and minus 1 have exactly the same electron density, right? If I take the phase out, right? So out of those, I might actually be able to mm -hmm. construct some sort of interesting decoherence-free subspace because the BEC should not tell, be able to tell the difference to the okay. leading mm -hmm. approximation, yeah. right? So that we indeed yeah. might want to look at some point in the future. Okay, thank you. 
So I have a question, uh, Sebastian. Yep. Uh, so, so this uh, energy transport, simulation of energy transport using network atoms. So these are, I think, the pictures you showed, the dynamics. These are 1D problems, right? Uh, this one? Yeah. This, yeah, this one, this uh, dynamics of uh, certain. Uh, yeah, so this was a 1D chain of, say, here we have 10 Rudbeck atoms in this. Now not was Einstein condensate for that earlier project here. This is uh, okay. thermal gas. And on that thermal gas, there's two lasers at, at work that essentially create a ladder, ladder scheme root back EIT. Right? So these, this is like, um, like a three level system in which you can have electromagnetically induced transparency. And mm -hmm. that essentially means that because of that coupling beam here, you can make the whole gas transparent for the probe beam. Now those are the green atoms. And now the way this works is that the upper level of the EIT is also a Rudbeck state. It's not the S or P state, some other principal quantum number. And because of that, this R state here has very strong interactions with my aggregate Rudbeck atoms. And that means whenever the ground state atoms are very close to the Rudbeck atom here shown in red, then these guys shift this one away in energy. And that destroys EIT, right? So this is it's like that state is no longer there. And I don't have my three level system anymore and EIT is gone, right? So these red atoms scatter light, the green ones don't. And you see that sort of they are clustered around the atom, so I can measure where is my Rudbeck atom. And for the right choice of parameters, the range of those light scattering atoms around the P atom is larger. So this can effectively measure the state, right? And what we then see is indeed that to the extent that my thermal gas background can measure whether the Rudbeck aggregate is in S or P, sorry, whether one of the atoms in the Rudbeck aggregate is an SOP, to that extent, it decoheres the transport because it measures what happens in the transport. Hmm. Right? So, and because all these properties depend on these EIT lasers, this is very highly tunable. Right? So the selling point here was you can controllably introduce decoherence, very little, very much. And you also can somehow uh, introduce this uh, feature here that the energy in the actual light harvesting complex is slightly disordered. So because yeah. each of these uh, aggregate atom has a slightly different cold gas background. Yeah, so, so uh, my question is related to this disorder. I mean, if you have a certain disorder in this 1D, effective 1D system, then yep. you experience this kind of localization of excitations. So, yes, yeah, I must again admit that the right, so disorder is a very extensive field and we haven't looked at much at that beyond the point that there is disorder, right? So we wanted to show we can make disorder Mm -hmm. and uh, control the strength, right? So here, indeed, like, so what we did look at, uh, I, I don't remember the details now, it's some time ago, right? So we looked at the uh, the exponents of the excitation spreading on that lattice, right? And, and showed that you can sort of vary it from uh, diffusive to ballistic to subdiffusive or whatever, okay. right? So this sort of typical indications of disorder over there, we didn't really mm -hmm. look at strict localization. Right? Localization was sort of, we got it in another funny way unrelated to disorder, if you very strongly measure, right? So you, you crank this all up, you get a very strong measurement immediately, then you get this quantum Zeno effect where your yeah, P excitation just stays on the initial side. Mm -hmm. I don't think but that's called is, localization. But, but this is not true localization. This is probably quasi yeah, localization. Fa fake localization. <laughs> true, yeah. Okay, so there is a one more uh, question. Uh, no. Some, some other... If there is a question in the chat, I would have to ask you to no, no, no. because I somehow lost my, my button where I could see the chat. <laughs> no, it was directed to me, actually. OK. So okay. if there are no other questions, so let us thank Professor Uster once again uh, for this exciting talk. Thank, thank you very much. For Thanks for having me. Bye bye, everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get out of this. So over to the organizers for any comments or Umakant or Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I don't have any comments. Uma okay. yeah. yeah, so thank you. So it's the end of the Sebastian. Yeah. So the day is over, right? I mean, uh, we have the next we, talk. We have the yeah. next talk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Now, we have a third talk in this webinar on quantum simulation and computation with cold atoms. So our next speaker is Professor Buddhistya Santra from IIT Delhi. And he is working on cold trapped uh, atoms 
he's an experimentalist and he's a more focused in our uh, quantum simulation, quantum computing, quantum communication, quantum sensing. And uh, uh, yes, Professor Santra is here. So uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can hear you. So okay. you can uh, share your slides. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And let me share my slides. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. You can it now. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the kind introduction and for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, to speak about what we have been doing um, over last couple of years and also what we are uh, doing in the present uh, months and years. So uh, today I'll be discussing about um, some quantum state engineering, uh, which is actually driven by uh, control dissipation. So um, the dissipation is something which is the most uh, 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 strong adversary to any kind of quantum system, either it's a quantum computing or communication or sensing or quantum simulation. So today we'll discuss some of the uh, ways uh, which was proposed by theory um, that if dissipation is present in the system from the beginning as a constant parameter, uh, we can also uh, end up into some states which are uh, basically not an equilibrium state, but it's a uh, highly equilibrium. And these are basically steady states. And these states are uh, quite robust against any kind of environmental uh, decoherence. Uh, so the picture what you see here, so uh, these are uh, about five uh, quantum uh, uh, quantum systems, and this can be single atoms, or this can be uh, Josephson junctions array, or this can be single ions. Now, uh, when we uh, have such a system in our experimental architecture, uh, we have a complete Hamiltonian. So it's not necessary always that the whole system is disturbed, but as these Hamiltonians are connected, uh, you can think of these are uh, the springs uh, which are connecting uh, some balls. And then if you uh, put disturbance in one of them, then the whole spring will start to uh, you know, oscillate. And uh, now uh, let's uh, think about a system, quantum system. When we think about this quantum system, we uh, do not really see this environment which is outside. Even when we write the Hamiltonian, we have only the, uh, the interaction part and uh, the single uh, particle uh, uh, energy parts. But um, in the reality, we have this environment present always. Uh, they are coming in the form of, let's say, the, um, the, the stray magnetic fields or some uh, phase noise from a laser or some other background vapor gas. So a real treatment can be done uh, if we take this uh, other uh, sources of disturbance and perturbations into account. But the interesting thing is that we see that uh, uh, the, the result of the decoherence always in, in our uh, quantum system. So here is a simple example. So if we think of a single atom, uh, which is having two levels. So one is a ground state and the other one is the excited state. Now, in the ideal case, if we drive some uh, Rabi oscillations or uh, if we do some Ramsey spectroscopy, then we will see the contrast of uh, uh, populations, uh, uh, which is uh, representing either the ground state or the excited state. So that population will keep on oscillating. And ideally this should keep on going for infinite time. But in the real life, when we do these experiments, we see that uh, this oscillation has some decay. And this decay is due to the uh, external perturbation which causes a change of the states. And that is the uh, manifestation of the environment which is present around us. Now, uh, there could be two ways. One is to uh, try to isolate the quantum system, I mean, as good as possible. So just minimizing these perturbations to reach the quantum system. And the second one is the um, uh, using decoherence as a resource for uh, generating uh, long-term and robust uh, coherence in terms of a steady state. So in a sense, so in an open quantum system, so coherence uh, decays over time. So uh, the way uh, some of the theory papers uh, proposed how we can use uh, uh, this dissipation as a resource of engineering uh, steady states was the following. So if we have uh, some isolated quantum system, we can model them um, 
as if they were connected to some um, bar. And now uh, such a system can be uh, you know, modeled using uh, such a equation where this part is representing the Hamiltonian of the system. Plus there is another term. This is basically the Liouville operator. So this um, uh, includes the dissipation term. Uh, which is basically uh, the environment induced perturbation, which is causing uh, some kind of loss. It can be particle loss, it can be loss of phase. Uh, but at the end of the day, so this is causing uh, the wave function of the quantum system deviated from what it was supposed to be in the ideal case. So uh, according to these theoretical proposals, it was uh, predicted that if the dissipation is uh, present into the system from the very beginning as a constant uh, parameter, then uh, after some transient time, so the system um, uh, uh, is driven to a steady state. Now, uh, the question is, can we um, reach to some steady state, which is kind of a deterministic steady state, uh, which we know from the beginning uh, or from the earlier uh, stage that, okay, this is the steady state, uh, state. if we can reach there, so our quantum uh, state initialization would be uh, uh, getting a very good starting. And this would also be uh, much less prone towards any kind of environmental uh, dissipation. So in order to uh, do such experiments, we need some uh, um, engineering of controlled dissipation. So how can we do that? There could be several ways of uh, introducing controlled dissipation. So one of the example is using an ion chain. So in an ion chain, so the complete Hamiltonian is kind of connected. So as if they are connected by springs, and now if you just um, you know uh, put a uh, some perturbation on one of the ions, so then also the whole system gets affected because whole Hamiltonian is part of them. So this could be one way of um, engineering um, and 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 chain of uh, engineering a, a control dissipation in a chain of chain of uh, ions, uh, which which represents a chain of spins, chain of interacting spins. And the similar situation can be realized using a chain of uh, Rydberg atoms where uh, the Rydberg excitation is enough so that it, uh, the Rydberg blocket radius reaches at least to the nearest neighbor. Now, uh, there was also some experiments uh, which was performed. Uh, so, so this type of experiment using ions was performed in the group of um, Rainer Blatt and uh, Dave Weinland and uh, perhaps few other groups also. And then using uh, circular Rydberg atoms. So um, there were some very nice experiments uh, uh, performed in the group of Sergeros. Um, so they passes this circular Rydberg atom through uh, superconducting cavities. And now when these uh, atoms are passing through the cavities, so the cavity field uh, interrupted the internal Hamiltonian of the atom. And that also causes some uh, change of the, um, uh, the internal state of the atoms. And that's how they were uh, uh, you know, engineering the dissipation in a very controlled way. And uh, in, in this setup, they did quite some nice experiments. So there was quite some uh, interesting discussion um, in, in our last speaker's talk, which was uh, discussing about the decoherence free subspace. And in this setup, actually, they have uh, looked into such uh, very nice states. Uh, and in, in this decoherence free subspace means it's, it's, it's not really uh, making the whole space free of decoherence, but you know, uh, if you can think of a complete Hilbert space, then perhaps you can, if you think of it like a area of, it's, it's a very large area in a very, you know, just to visualize the picture, then just as if you put this coherence in some specific state, which you are able to uh, put it in isolation uh, with respect to the main Hamiltonian. So that's basically putting that decoherence in, in, in one specific state. So, so this kind of experiments was uh, performed here. And now there are also uh, other kinds of experiments. Um, um, and now um, this decoherence or loss channel can be, as I was mentioning you, it can also be done in terms of uh, particle loss. So now particle loss can be uh, engineered, either it's a two particle, uh, one particle, or maybe three particle. So we can do that either uh, using a scanning electron microscope. So that was done in the group of uh, Professor Herrick Ott in Kaiserslautern. Um, so I was also part of this experiment. And there are other techniques, like if we tune the interaction, so interatomic interactions using phase back resonance. Then also you can get like a single particle, two particle and three particle um, uh, interactions. And uh, if these interactions are uh, very, very strong, then we also can uh, expect controlled loss dynamics. 
Uh, so, very similar thing can also be obtained using photo association. So, using uh, some laser, uh, which can combine two uh, atoms, and then these atoms can be put into a high energetic state so that uh, the trapping potential is not enough to uh, confine them anymore. So, this uh, particular work uh, of looking into the uh, decoherence dynamics in a Bosabar model was uh, investigated in the group of uh, Takahashi uh, from Japan. So now uh, in today's talk, I'll be mostly focusing on uh, the four things. So first of all, uh, I'll be discussing about uh, the steady states we have observed in a driven dissipative superfluid. Um, and then I'll be discussing about how we can apply such a technique for uh, you know, kind of uh, realizing a noise jitter in a quantum signal processing uh, uh, architecture. So then I'll be discussing about, so how, how can we suppress decoherence in, for a single atom uh, by using a magic intensity uh, optical tweezer trap? And then I'll be discussing about uh, the quantum simulation and quantum computing with adage of single atoms. So the, basically the, the recent works what we are uh, focusing at the moment. So uh, to start with this driven dissipative superfluid, so a, a driven dissipative system is something uh, where there is a loss mechanism going on. And in the same time, there is a gain mechanism going on. So this, this phenomena can be observed not only in the quantum regime, but also in various types of classical regimes. So this is an example what you can see. This is a low range contour. And in such systems, there is a loss which is uh, you know, coming into the system. And, and I mean, you can also think this like, like if you think of a glass of water uh, having two holes. One hole is at the uh, upper part of the glass, which is uh, behaving like inlet uh, through which you can send the water into the glass. And now uh, there's an outlet, which is towards the bottom part through which the water can come out of this uh, glass container. Now, when this rate of inlet and outlets are same, then you will see as if that um, the, the, the level of the water in the glass is not changing, but there's a dynamics going on. So that is uh, fundamentally different from a equilibrium state, but uh, this gives a really steady state. It's a strong dynamics going on, but uh, uh, it's not everything is static. It's some, something is uh, going on, but some specific thing of our interest. So in the example of this glass, so the level of the, um, uh, this, this water is this constant. So in a very similar way, in other systems, we can also engineer uh, such situations where there is a flow of um, information and then uh, inflow of information and outflow of information. But into this specific system, we can keep the quantum state uh, as if there is not much change. So this is also called sometimes a, a fixed point. And uh, the similar, this phenomena can be objected in classical systems like a, uh, like a CR markets or any kind of uh, the, the water vortex and so on. Now, uh, the very similar uh, phenomena can also be observed into the, uh, the quantum systems. So a quantum system can have uh, um, some tunneling dynamics, for example, uh, which can um, uh, contribute towards this, uh, you know, this adding to the system part. So the gain to the system. And there could be some uh, decoherence, which can be either a particle loss or loss of information in terms of phase. And that could uh, lead to this uh, loss term. Now, if we can make a very good balance of these uh, two types of um, interaction uh, to this quantum system, then uh, we should be in principle able to reach some steady states, which are uh, very robust against any kind of environmental uh, decoherence. And first of all, uh, if we can realize such a quantum system, it will have a very good uh, um, settings and it will provide a very good platform to study rich uh, non-equilibrium dynamics. And uh, the second of all, um, uh, for the quantum computing, if we can realize such steady states to the qubit level, uh, we can also start and then implement long, uh, so the quantum circuits which are involving long pulses uh, in a very successful way. So uh, for the demonstration of the uh, physics uh, here, so we uh, used a system where we had a Bose-Einstein condensate of rubidium atoms. And then as you can see uh, on the right side plots, we have uh, loaded them into uh, optical traps. So these traps were realized using uh, red detuning, uh, uh, so um, far off resonant uh, uh, lasers. And the distance between each trap is about um, uh, 600 nanometer or so. In this case, actually, we had uh, used a 2D lattice. So as if um, we have an 2D array of 
um, uh, wares, so quantum wares. And now uh, these wares are filled with atoms. Now we made this picture from the top, so that's why they looks like um, a dot. But this is basically the integration over a line. And each of these dots were containing about 80 atoms or so. So this is not yet going into the single particle level. I will also show you some more examples uh, later where we have used uh, uh, like about 700 uh, particles or so. But uh, in the, one of the main focus of our present group uh, is to you know, go to the more fewer and fewer atoms and then see whether the similar uh, events can be observed or not. Okay, now the other part, so that's the decoherence or the engineer dissipation part that we did using a scanning electron microscope. So this was a um, custom built scanning, scanning electron microscope where we have used a very focused uh, electron beam with a full width half maximum of around 100 nanometer or so. And you can see the picture below uh, where we have written here this H psi equals to E psi. So we have determin deterministically removed uh, atoms from some of the specific sites. And uh, okay, the same technique was also used for uh, making the complete image, but that time we did not uh, apply this field, uh, this electron beam for a longer time. Now, uh, when we can do that, so we can also uh, in a very controlled way initiate a, um, uh, you know, the initial state to create uh, or to start the dynamics of a non-equilibrium dynamics with a, um, with a tunneling plus a loss. So this is what we did. So um, to start, so before starting the dynamic, we prepared the system. For that, we prepared the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate and then we ramp up a 1D lattice. So in the last picture, I was showing you 2D lattice. But now for doing this uh, driven dissipated uh, superfluid study, we just uh, loaded the Bose-Einstein condensate into a 1D lattice. So at the end, what we get is an array of coupled Josephson junctions. Now, uh, so this each, uh, uh, trap. So each 1D taps, trap. So what you see here. So these are basically a 2D uh, or quasi 2D Bose Einstein condensate. And uh, we see them like this line because again, we uh, make the image from the top. That's why we get an integrated uh, profile of a, like if you imagine it uh, like a disk, like a circular disk. And if you take a projection of that, you will get a kind of a line distribution. So that's what we get here. And that's why it looks like a line, but they are actually like a 2D quasi, uh, uh, so, so quasi 2D uh, BEC. And uh, after preparing this uh, uh, state, uh, we uh, ramp up the lattice uh, in such a high level so that the whole system's dynamics became frozen. Uh, so no tunneling can happen. And in this scenario, we have removed almost all the atoms from one of the central side. So what happens as a consequence? We have created a, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, kind of a hole into this uh, array of quantum systems. Now, once there is a hole, so if we allow the particles to tunnel, so the particles from left side will tunnel into this hole and the particles from right side will again tunnel into the hole. And at the same time, we will keep our dissipation potential on uh, with a controlled dissipation rate uh, in this side. So there will be two things happening into the central side. So one is incoming flow and the other one is the outgoing uh, rate of uh, atoms. So this is exactly what we did. And now the results are shown here. So we did actually uh, this experiment with two different uh, initial conditions. The one condition when we, when we remove all the atoms from this uh, central site, the lossy site, and the result is the following. So this uh, red uh, boxes, so these are showing. So at the beginning, there was no atom, but as uh, the dynamics keep on going, so that means the atoms were filling into this, plus the, um, the, the, the incoherent loss mechanism was going on. So uh, in the presence of these both dynamics, so the system reaches a steady state after this transient time, something like this here. Now we repeated the same experiment, but we changed the initial condition. So we did not remove any atom from this uh, site. We just keep it as it is, um, which is the same as all other neighboring sites. So then also we saw that uh, the uh, system did not really go down uh, in filling, but it really stays there. So basically both the um, uh, conditions, initial conditions was uh, reaching a uh, same uh, steady state. So uh, now uh, this phenomena we, we uh, you know, plotted here. So this, uh, um, this filling, these are actually uh, steady state filling. So if I go back here, so the filling what you see here, 
for this very low dissipation. So this steady state filling we have uh, plotted here and the dissipation was towards the lower end. And what we do, what we see here that whatever we do uh, in terms of dissipation and in terms of initial condition, the system always reaches it. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a filling level. So it's so always 100% fill, which is very similar to the uh, superfluid behavior. So that means when, whatever we do to the system, the system always be into the uh, filled state because of the superfluid flow, which is filling up the gap, filling up the hole. Now, uh, when you do this experiment with a very high dissipation rate going more than 200 uh, per second or so. So then again, we see uh, that um, both the systems are going into uh, a same state, but there is a fundamental difference. So in this case, the system is not getting completely full. There's a gap. There's a gap from the 100% filling. So this we can imagine as if there is a resistive flow and as uh, if we have a, a resistive wire and if we send some um, a current, it, it gets some drop due to the resistance if it's not a superconducting wire. So this phenomena is something similar to that. Now, a uh, very interesting thing happens at the in-between uh, dissipation. So here we see that depending on the initial state, um, even for the same dissipation, uh, the two branches, so are so so. I mean, these two initial conditions are giving two branches of steady state. So something like this and that. So that means uh, we can really tune the um, targeted state, like which state we'd like to go by, even not only tuning the dissipation, but also choosing carefully the um, um, the initial state. So that gives a very good uh, uh, you know demonstration of what was proposed in theory that we can observe uh, um, targeted steady states, and we can even observe um, coexistence of targeted steady states in terms of a biostability or so. So now uh, we have been talking about the flow of uh, particles and so on. So in order to look into uh, this superfluid behavior, in order to verify that, we did one more step. So we find out what is the rate of flow of the particle, uh, basically this uh, ultra gold atoms into this um, lossy side. And when we did that, we uh, found a current that is basically the rate of flow of particles into this, uh, into this lossy site. So that is plotted in this axis. And then in the other axis, the X axis, we plotted the dissipation. And again, we saw that um, the, the, the rate of flow is quite high um, for the case uh, uh, where, uh, like if I go back once, where we had seen uh, the system was filled. So the lossy site was filled up to a very large uh, rate of decoherence. So that means this, this system was showing more, you know, superfluid behavior, more in terms of uh, dissipation. Now, uh, we can see a very interesting uh, plot here. If we replace this x-axis with a chemical potential difference, because this chemical potential difference is a very analogous to the voltage difference. If we think of a uh, conducting wire, in this conducting wire, there will be the difference of voltage that gives the voltage difference. Now for this uh, quantum tunneling device, so we can have this, um, uh, the, so the difference in chemical potential. So that will give the uh, uh, analogous to this voltage. So now what we have is a curve, which is uh, very similar to the IV characteristics. And what you see here that uh, that chemical potential difference of zero, we see a finite current and we see a finite current for the, uh, this, this red boxes, but the, the effect for the blue, where we have seen a uh, better superfluid behavior, even for a higher, uh, decoherence, so that is quite high. So that is very similar to the um, behavior of a superconductor. So if we have a superconductor, then if we had a uh, voltage drop of zero, we can see a very high current. And of course, this is possible only if there is a quantum me quantum mechanical phase gradient is uh, present into the system. This is not possible to describe only by you know the uh, the particle flux, but we have to take into account the um, uh, the quantum mechanical phase gradient. Now, um, I mean, we, uh, okay. So now, uh, I mean, when we did this experiment, there was uh, not much theoretical explanations. We have been trying it for a year or so, but recently I learned from some of my collaborators in Australia, so David, Matthias David actually. So they have developed a very nice theory uh, using the C-field model of non-equilibrium dynamics that they can, they can capture this whole dynamics using one theory. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, this paper is in archive. Uh, but now I'm going to show some interesting uh, result where we are using this and 
we are kind of using it in order to engineer a noise eater for a quantum signal processing. So basically what we have uh, engineered here is a perfect absorber, uh, which uh, you know, completely extinguishes any kind of incoming radiation uh, by means of a complex potential. So uh, this complex potential is basically, if you remember this uh, Lindblad Hamiltonian, so this Lindblad blood Hamiltonian uh, is um, considering the dispersion term. So this is actually the complex potential. Now, uh, this phenomenon of coherent perfect absorption, so this was uh, observed in various types of classical medium, uh, including the sound waves, and in various types of this head spawns. So this is also used in a quite extensive way to, uh, no to, to you know, filter out any kind of unwanted noise. So the main idea is that if we have a nonlinear absorber, then uh, what happens is that there is a uh, very um, distinct extension of the uh, incoming wave due to the fact that the incoming and uh, outgoing radiation gets completely destructively interfered. And due to that, there is no reflection or no transmission happens. So whatever radiation comes into this absorption, they get completely absorbed. So uh, the one uh, necessary thing to build such a model is that the incoming radiation must have a, a very good uh, wave uh, propagation um, uh, characteristic. And there should be this destructive interference, which should be supported by uh, this observer uh, for the transmitted and reflected wave waves, which is basically then giving nothing is uh, going out of this medium. So now how can we uh, engineer such a uh, phenomena with uh, um, so dissipative potentials in a uh, array of um, coupled quantum systems? So for that, again, we used a very similar technique. So we have, again, uh, inflow of radiation. So, so why you are calling this a radiation? Because this is a nonlinear wave. And from where this nonlinearity non comes? Because these atoms are interacting. So these interactions are uh, giving rise to the nonlinear effect. So that gives the, uh, you know, the driving to the system. That's the tunneling part. If you look into the, uh, this um, uh, Hamiltonian, so this first part is uh, what is uh, drawn here with this inflow here. And the second part is the interaction. So that is uh, happening in each sites because this is an interacting system. Uh, that is basically making it a nonlinear radiation, which is going towards this absorbing site. And then the dissipation is, uh, actually giving uh, by this electron beam here. This is uh, engineering the complex uh, absorb absorption uh, medium. So now, um, again, we started with the Bose-Einstein condensate and the system preparation was very similar to uh, what we have uh, uh, done for the last experiment. So I'm not going into too much detail. And then uh, for an absorptive absorption potential, which was realized by this electron beam, uh, we see this complete extension of uh, incoming radiation to this absorptive, uh, absorptive site. And uh, now the superfluid flow, which goes towards the central lossy site, this is because of the tunneling and the nonlinearity uh, is happening into the system due to the interatomic uh, collisions. So these interactions are happening because the atoms are colliding between each other and that gives rise to the nonlinear uh, property, this income. So if we now look into the uh, results, so we see that um, uh, for some um, moderate dissipation, so actually it's up to 250 uh, per second, the dissipation rate. So you see the picture is exactly same. So if, if this dissipation or this absorptive part was not there, then we would assume the system would fill up more and more, but uh, we do not see that. We see that the system is exactly same. So the central side is exactly same as the other side. So this is as if uh, we have a very clean filtered system where any kind of radiation which is coming from the outside that is uh, you know, canceled out due to this, uh, uh, due to the presence of this complex absorber. So as if we are having a um, you know, noise eater, but in the uh, context of quantum uh, domain. Now, if we increase, if we further increase the distribution, then we really see the dissipative effect then because then uh, these atoms are really completely uh, going out of the central side, and then uh, we entered another regime, which is the dissipating regime. So we have summarized these results here. You see that up to certain um, uh, level of dissipation, we see this coherent perfect, perfect absorb absorption of matter waves. And after that, after this threshold value, we see uh, the system enters a dissipative uh, region. So this threshold actually ideally should be 
um, proportional to uh, 4j over h cross, where j is the tunneling rate into the lattice. Um, but in our case, we see that uh, the system breaks down uh, already much before that. And we are making some estimates um, why it was happening like that. And uh, we think that it could happen due to the finite system size of the atom. And also, uh, um, like in this, all these uh, condensates. So this was uh, um, trapped in a parabolic trap. So that means when you go from the central towards the, uh, towards the end, so the finite age was reaching quite fast. So the population in all sites was not exactly the same. But uh, this was giving a, uh, some, um, you know, first demonstration of a coherent perfect absorption, absorption phenomena um, for nonlinear matter waves in a coupled uh, quantum system. And um, I think this can, if we can apply this uh, in the settings of quantum information for filtering out noise, it could be an, an, an interesting application of that. So now I will move towards what we are doing at the moment. So basically we are looking into how to preserve coherence into a single qubit made of uh, cesium atoms now, and also it, uh, trapped in an optical tweezer. So this work we are doing in collaboration with our uh, our colleagues from PRL Ahmedabad and then Guru Nanak Dev University in Amritsar. So um, when we trap a single atom uh, in an optical tweezer, so basically what happens is that this trapping light has um, electrical and magnetic uh, parts. Now, uh, as this um, atom, so we can, if we think of uh, it as a two level system, so then due to the presence of this electric field, there are some shift um, in terms of stark effect. And now this shift is not necessarily same for both the states. I mean, both the ground state and the excited state. And as a consequence, so there is a definitely change of energy, but this is not a linear change of energy. So as you see here, so now, if we trap an atom and then if we do some uh, state initialization and then for example, in terms of a, a rotation gate, just imagine that we uh, created a, uh, um, we, we trapped an atom and then we created a, uh, we pump the atom into a specific state and then we make some rotation. And then at the end, we measure this uh, uh, final state again. So ideally what we should get, we will not get because of this change of energy due to the trapping light. So we wanted to investigate how we can minimize this effect uh, for the case of a single qubit. And we can model this, uh, 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 this light shift uh, by using this formula where this UA is representing the trap depth and uh, B is the magnetic field presence into the system. And beta one, beta two, beta four, these are the uh, parameters which are coming uh, from the atomic structure calculus. And actually our collaborators are providing us uh, inputs for calculating this. Now, um, here we have done some, uh, no, some theoretical study where you have seen that um, if we change the magnetic field, so from B equals to zero to uh, six Gauss in this case, so then this trapping depth, so that uh, changes, that basically um, uh, increases. And as a, uh, as a function of that, so the differential light shift also changes, right? Now, if we, um, uh, make a summary of this, uh, I mean, making a summary of this uh, lowest differential um, light shift um, as a function of the applied magnetic field, because you see as a function of magnetic field, this whole curve changes. So what you'll see that as a function of this magnetic field, we have this axis where the differential light shift would be uh, a minimum at this uh, corresponding case where the trap depth is zero. But we also have to be realistic because in the reality, if we have a, you know, zero trap depth. That means we have no, you have, we have physically no trapping potential. We will not be able to trap the uh, atom or trap the qubit. So that's why we have to go to very close to that so that we are just able to trap the atom, but we are also inducing a minimal amount of differential light shifts. So uh, the, the, the magnetic field corresponding to this zero trap depth here would be something close to five Gauss here. So we um, then investigated what happens at uh, very close to five. So that's what we did here. So we did this uh, calculation and this study at a magnetic field of 4.9 Gauss, and we looked into uh, what happens to the coherence. So we did a uh, uh, study uh, looking into the Ramsey signal. Well, these are all theoretical at the moment, but we are uh, hoping to uh, you know, do these measurements in the lab uh, in next few months or so. But uh, what you see here is that um, 
in this trap, so this was realized with a uh, uh, far off resonant light at 976 nanometer at a B field of uh, 4.9 Gauss. And we see a um, Ramsey uh, signal, uh, which is basically decaying uh, in a time scale of uh, um, like a little bit more than half a second or so. So actually at the moment we are uh, improving these results and we have, uh, <coughs> sorry, a <coughs> few, few seconds of time. But what you can see already at this moment that uh, the total coherence time of the single uh, CGM atom qubit is uh, long enough. Uh, why long enough? Because uh, this is about um, close to one second or so. And now um, if we want to implement some uh, quantum circuits, it would consist of a series of um, a few single qubit gates and few multi qubit gates. And uh, this multi qubit and single qubit gates would take uh, in the order of one microsecond or maybe less uh, for the case of Rydberg atoms and also for the case of uh, Raman induced single qubit gates. And then uh, if we need, let's say, total 50 uh, such uh, gates to uh, implement a, a simple circuit to start with, then it would be um, you know, taking about 50 microseconds, which is much, much smaller than the coherence time. Of course, in the future for the more and more universal type of quantum computing, we need to have more and more uh, uh, gates uh, to be implemented. Um, but this already gives a good starting point. Um, now, uh, there are many uh, such experiments which are being developed uh, all over the world. And there was very nice talks yesterday and today. Uh, so I'll not give too much detail about it. But uh, I mean, uh, this gives a very good uh, uh, you know, potential for cold atoms uh, towards realizing a um, you know, large scale quantum computing hardware. Uh, so some of the key points I will just summarize here. So about what are the unique uh, points about a cold atom quantum computer? So first thing is uh, this qubits, what we are using, these are, um, these are basically nature's gift. And that's why they are 100% perfect and they are 100% uh, free from any kind of production errors. So if we have a quantum um, uh, computer made of single atom qubits here, and if we have something, or if we want to make something in the Mars some years later, then if we use a CGM atom, the CGM atoms at Mars and CGM atoms at Earth would be identical because this is just fundamental, uh, one fundamental entity, right? Another thing is uh, very important that is cooling the uh, uh, qubits. So that is basically, um, needed in order to uh, take care of the decoherence mechanism. And uh, using um, the cooling techniques, the laser cooling techniques, subduptor cooling technique, and uh, also if we uh, want to use evaporative cooling technique, then we can very uh, easily uh, can go down to micro Kelvin and even to nano Kelvin temperatures. And that also provides us a very good initial state for uh, further you know, implementing the gates and circuits. Uh, other thing is the uh, final state measurement. So some of the best um, uh, uh, you know, precision measurement uh, for the case of qubit can be done using the atomic qubits because you know, the, uh, the microwave clocks are based on CGMs and rubidiums. So they are really very, very highly accurate. So giving an accuracy of in the order of 10 to the power um, um, minus 15 or so. Now uh, the optical lattice clocks, which are realized using strontium and ytterbium, so alkali earth atoms basically. So they are actually losing almost 100 milliseconds over the lifetime of the universe, which is, uh, I mean, very, very good. Now uh, this gives a very good uh, uh, you know, um, potential for doing the final state measurement. Now uh, this truly scalable quantum computing hardware, this is also, I just mentioned. So, um, I mean, it's not that we have this, we had this for the last couple of uh, decades or so, but uh, when we started putting um, this uh, single atoms into optical traps, so that started around 2002 or so, when uh, the group of Emmanuel Bloch was realized the first uh, superfluid to mod insulator uh, quantum phase transition. So that, so such systems trapped uh, really arrays of 3D atoms into uh, a very periodic potential, but there was one problem with those systems. As the uh, loading of the atoms was probabilistic, so all the uh, neighboring sites were not essentially, essentially filled. But you can imagine that if we want to you know, design a quantum computer, and if we miss an atom, that's not something which is acceptable for the, um, the algorithms. So that's why there was a need to make a defect-free array of atoms. And this was very nicely uh, implemented uh, by the groups of uh, Michael Lukin in Harvard and the uh, Brouwer's group 
in uh, in, in in France a uh, few years back. And now this cold atom system are also uh, able to make defect free arrays of uh, qubits, which are ideal for uh, uh, you know, quantum computing. And again, this high fidelity individual uh, addressing of qubits, which is necessary for uh, implementing any kind of local uh, qubit manipulation. So we can use the um, high resolution quantum gas microscopy technique. So as a whole, so I'm just trying to make a summary that uh, cold atom quantum compute uh, uh, architecture gives a most tractable and pragmatic approach to build a scalable quantum computer. And there's one more thing which is uh, perhaps not here. So this cooling thing. So it does not require any uh, large refrigerators like a dilution refrigerator, which is required for the case of superconducting qubits. Okay, sometimes in order to uh, cool the Rydberg system, one needs to use such systems, but even without that, uh, one could really create uh, maybe thousands of qubits. We have seen such examples in uh, the talks from yesterday's speakers and some from today's speakers. Uh, so some of the main applications um, uh, for uh, such quantum computing could be several. So in the quantum machine learning or artificial intelligence, and one of the main application in uh, network optimization. So this network optimization can be applied uh, to near-term quantum computing um, uh, problems. And for example, if we have a robot like, and this robot has to uh, supply uh, maybe food to uh, five different places, what should be the network it should, it should go to minimize its time? So these are the problems which are classical in nature, but really hard. So it's a NP hard class of problems, which are taking quite some long time, even for the super country computers. Now, if we can uh, implement such problems into a, a quantum computer, then we can benefit a lot already using the state of the art uh, quantum computing architecture. There could be also applications in quantum communications, preserving uh, the cyber security for physical infrastructure. There could be quantum uh, system simulation and modeling of uh, different types of chemicals and also for quantum drug designs. And uh, also for the case of precision uh, navigation and timing, of course, we need a set of high precision sensors. Uh, but we also, we also need to make a uh, synchronization among this uh, network and we have to uh, you know, collect this information and process this information to find a final uh, you know, uh, uh, deterministic uh, uh, outcome. So for that also we need uh, different kinds of uh, complex uh, protocols and algorithms and of course having um, a set of qubits which can be used to play uh, uh, and, and test such alg algorithms would be very, very beneficial. So now, uh, finally, um, this is the team who, who, with whom we are working. So this is really great to work with them. And we are a new lab. So we have started building our lab uh, for last two years. And uh, without their really dedicated work, it, it really would have not been possible to uh, reach um, the way we are moving now. And we are actually building uh, more or less everything from scratch, from lasers, from vacuum chambers, data acquisition systems. and each of the students are working dedicatedly uh, in one or the other aspects, and some of them are also looking into theory. And besides that also, we have uh, some um, uh, BTEC, MTEC, and MSc students or, uh, uh, with, with a very good enthusiasm. And we also uh, are collaborating with uh, some of our uh, very good, well-known uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm not mentioning all of their names uh, here, uh, but there will be some uh, uh, talk tomorrow uh, it would be presented uh, by uh, Dr. Prasanna and, uh, and Shreta, so which is a, a kind of a collaborative work, what we have started uh, towards uh, making a quantum um, you know, computing uh, algorithm using few qubit um, uh, you know, CGM atom uh, system. So uh, I would like to uh, you know, uh, make a small advertisement before concluding my talk, uh, because we are also getting funds from uh, IIT Delhi's Institute of Eminence um, Fund, and also from um, IHA Foundation from Robotics. And as our mandate is also to de develop skills, we have to develop uh, some uh, uh, skill development programs. And this is something what we have developed. And if some of you are interested as an organization or as an individual, um, you can uh, get in touch with uh, me. And this is actually a certificate course, uh, which would be uh, the certificate would be given by the IIT Delhi and IHFC. And in this course, we'll be covering the fundamentals of quantum computing, uh, solving optimization problems. Uh, and then we'll also discuss various state-of-the-art quantum computing hardware and how to do some basic quantum simulations uh, uh, using uh, uh, the QSKIP 
and then also quantum computing for robotics. As I was mentioning briefly that robotics can have uh, some applications in quantum computing because there are plenty of problems like uh, the bean packing and path planning, which are actually very hard problems in terms of this NP hardness. So if we can implement such problems uh, onto the near term uh, quantum optimizers um, in terms of a quantum annealing problem, uh, so this robotics uh, society would also be very much benefited. And also how can we implement uh, like this artificial intelligence and quantum technologies together? So perhaps uh, the quantum technology can be benefited from artificial intelligence and then artificial intelligence um, can also be uh, made much more richer uh, in, with, with, the, with the implementation of uh, quantum technology. Uh, so if someone uh, or some organization is interested, please uh, get in touch with me. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Santra. Now talk is open for discussion or take question. So I can see one question here. Uh, it's given by Yash Roth. So how that absorber engineered? I think he asking you showed one slide. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, so this one you mean, right? Uh, before previous that, one. Uh, previous one. Previous yeah. one. Yeah. So this one. Yeah. This yes, one, right? Yes. Yeah. So actually, this is uh, a cartoon of how um, uh, one could realize such an absorb, such a such a whole system consisting of a absorber <coughs> and some incoming radiation. <coughs> Sorry. So here you can see that. Uh, so this incoming radiation is coming, but there is neither a reflection or neither a transmission. So now, uh, when we implement that uh, in terms of uh, atoms and uh, optical traps, so this is how we did that. So this is the realization of that absorber using ultra gold atoms. So we have an array of couple Josephson junctions. Now when the, so this is basically a 1D light. So now when these uh, uh, atoms are tunneling uh, towards this, just imagine that this, there was no atoms so at the beginning. So in that situation, the atoms will tunnel to this uh, central side. So that is basically the incoming radiation. But now when we have this um, complex potential uh, designed by this focused electron beam, so this causes atom loss. Now this atom, uh, so this is basically the dissipative potential. So now dissipative, this dissipative potential is mimicking the behavior of the absorber. Could I, uh, could I answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Professor Saiket, you can ask directly. No, yeah, uh, really nice talk, um, uh, So, so I had a question on that uh, that Josephson uh, data that you showed, where the, those red sides are filling up and the blue sides are kind of saturating. Yeah, uh, no, not this one earlier, the first one, very first one. Yeah, this one, it almost seems like in the red curve, you have some not even hidden, very clear like oscillations while it's um, saturating. Is that real or is that some artifact? Um, I think this even is- Even in the blue um, one, there's some oscillation. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. So, so this is a data I put on purpose because here we did not do any kind of post-processing. This is just the uh, um, uh, data and then we have just plotted it. So what you see here, this is just due to the, um, you know, for example, this one. So this is a bit low. So this is um, due to the, this is not a real effect, but this is due to the, I think this state preparation and measurement, all, all those things. And when we did this, uh, uh, like a post-processing, and then we uh, really get a, uh, like a stable level. Then also, if you look at carefully, uh, this level was not right, like not exactly a straight line. So uh, this was like a very, very slow decay. So now the first one uh, to, to, to um, give answer your question. So this kind of fluctuation, what you see that. So this is uh, due to the state preparation and the measurements. And then the second one, uh, um, so that is due to the fact that uh, uh, these atoms were having collision with the background gas, which is of course very, very low. But that was giving this a very, very slow uh, slope. If you, if you look at here, then, and if you look at here, then you see that this average line is basically slowing it down. So these are the two things what you can see here. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, no problem. Dr. Santra, I also asked one question. You are showing the Ramsey fringes. Uh, yes. So in the, the leukin paper, Sapman, this paper group, they are showing the Ramsey fringes. Over some certain period, they are not decaying. Yeah. And you have you are showing some decaying. So what? Why is uh, their paper? They are taking the levels. They are showing. I I was thinking they are unaffected by the magnetic fields. Yeah. Because so, in the uh, ground state, huh? so why this uh, oxidation is decaying here? Yeah. So, um, I mean, uh, that's a uh, very uh, interesting and good question. So at the moment, what we are looking here, so what we are simulating here is the trap dynamics. Now, we um, did not add any other types of, any other types of, uh, let's say, dynamical decoupling pulses and so on. So, um, like if I refer to uh, uh, this, this looking paper, which was published in 2018, so, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there they have shown it, this phenomena very nicely, that one could also apply dynamical de decoupling, um, and then one could you know, increase this coherence time much further. Mm -hmm. But in this particular study, we wanted to uh, study the trap because we are also setting up our experiments. Uh, of course, uh, we can do this further pulse uh, you know, um, designing, in a more complex way, uh, yeah. we will do those things in the com times to come. But here we wanted to investigate, uh, like what is the um, effect of the, uh, you know, the, the the differential light shift, and is there any way to minimize that? So, th so that's why you see that they are decaying because this is just the atom is hold into the uh, trap, and whatever decay is happening, that is due to the, um, you know, the uh, light shift or the residual light shift which is happening. Um, in, in this atom due to the presence of the 976 nanometer light. I, I think at the moment we have little bit better results because we have been looking into what are the other um, uh, uh, possible sources of error. And I think at the moment we have it in the order of nine or eight or nine seconds, uh, but we okay. are working on it. So that's why we, we, I thought let's put it this one. Okay. Is that give the answer? Yeah, I got it. I will okay. uh, call it, but I will be calling you soon. <laughs> you. I'm also setting the same sense, uh, set up here. That would be great, yeah. Yeah. I think one of your uh, former student is working with us. Oh, nice to know. Yeah. So it was a very nice talk. So any one, uh, yes, Roth, you can contact directly to Professor Sandra about this course. And uh, any other question? Okay, so it was a nice talk. So thank you, Professor Sandra. And uh, we hope in future we see more years from your laboratory. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Sandra. Thank you very much for a wonderful thank talk. Thank you. Thank and, you for the kind uh, invitation. I would like to request the audience to come back again at uh, for the evening session where we have an interesting talk by Professor Thierry Lahai from France at 7.30 p.m. tonight, this evening. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Banudas, you would like to say something? Well, not uh, too much. Uh, okay. Okay, I think... Um... Uh, let me you know, thank uh, Dr. Santra again. I mean, it was a very interesting talk and, you know, uh, look forward to knowing more about your work in the future. Thank you also for the kind of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.